The Florida Gators and Utah Utes play in just a few weeks. And if you can't tell by the different layout, we got locked on crossover action, locked on Gators, locked on Utes here on Locked on Gators. You are locked on Gators, your daily podcast on the Florida Gators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Locked On Gators or Locked On Utes, both part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We are both available daily and free wherever you listen to podcasts. Happy Wednesday, Brandon Olson, host of Locked On Gators, JT Wistersill, host of Locked On Utes. And today's episode of Locked On Gators or Locked On Utes is brought to you by FanDuel, where you can make every moment more. Right now, when you've got a Super Bowl winner, you can get bonus bets back every time they win in the regular season. FanDuel.com slash Locked On. And JT, I don't know if you know this. You're like public enemy number one right now <laughs> um, for, for your wide receiver opinions, which we'll, we'll get to mm-hmm. in, in a little bit. But we are going to talk with easily, I think, the biggest story for mm-hmm. this game. Cam Rising, Utah's starting quarterback. He started last year. He's been a starter for multi-year starter at this point. And we'd be remiss to not talk about him right away. What is the feel for Utah's quarterback situation right now? So the feel is at this moment, Cam will be ready to go for game one. We have heard Cam say on numerous occasions that he will be ready for the game. Cam even said in last week's media availability, he said he's feeling as normal as he's been in a while, which he feels like is a really positive thing. He has been practicing. He's been throwing. Obviously, he's not been getting hit. Quarterbacks don't get hit in general in fall camp, but he's making good progress. We've seen clips of him throwing in general. He's looking good. It sounds like he's making the right steps necessary to get himself ready for game day on the 31st. Now, if he does suffer a setback at some point, which Kyle Whittingham, Cam said, like, I'll play. Kyle Whittingham's been a little bit more reserved, said, like, it's going to come down to the wire, um, that kind of things. I expect the week of them to even be kind of ambu- ambiguous about just the whole kind of situation in general and just kind of be like, well, we'll see if Cam's ready. He- he's done that before. But if Cam is not ready to go right now, what it sounds like it would be is Brandon Rose, who he'd be starting in his first ever college game. He looked the best of the bunch in spring practice, but you know, fall camp, it's a lot of time has passed. There is a world where a Bryson Barnes who has started in Cam's place on numerous occasions, Utah has a win against Washington State with him as a starter. And he led Utah in a touchdown drive in a really critical situation in the Rose Bowl against Ohio State a couple years ago. I'm still kept skeptical if they would go with a Brandon Rose over a Bryson Barnes, considering Bryson Barnes has already done that much. But I think Cam's going to play. I think Cam wants to play. When you look at the way last year's game ended, I think Cam's going to do everything in his power to be ready for that game. And I expect Cam Rising to be the starting quarterback against the Florida Gators. But... If because I, I fully yeah. agree with you, I, I think that Cam Rising will play. Just given everything we know about Cam Rising, he even has like the reputation of like being like an Iron Man kind of guy. Like he'll, he'll take the hits, he'll play through the pain. And sorry, Utah fans that are on this side, you can convince me Cam Rising's going to play. In fact, you'd have to convince me he's not going to play. However, you cannot convince me that he's going to be the cam rising that we've seen before he's not going to be 100 i don't care who it is that that says anything we know cam rising is going to be like yeah no, I'm, I'm good to go um but i just i feel like you can't convince me he's going to be 100 full go like last year big thing for me was cam rising converted multiple first downs with his legs against the florida gators that was something that hampered florida all year long cam rising is not going to be able to do that this year at least is it reasonable for me to go yeah i I fully don't expect him to be the mobile cam rising that we've seen frequently i would love to say that you're wrong brandon but unfortunately i think you're going to be right when we look at the history of cam rising let's look back to even the usc game he had powered in a two-point conversion he got hurt on that play missed the washington state game the one i already mentioned with the bryson Barnes stepping in though then he came back against arizona and stanford and look, it's a different injury, obviously, with what he sustained. That was a much more minor one because he's still able to play. But even just off of those, he wasn't the same quarterback. He's not taking contact the same way. He's not looking to run guys over 
in those games, he converted maybe one or two uh, first downs just with his legs overall, which watch him against Penn State. I mean, he's throwing his body around running guys over in general. That's when he's 100% healthy. That's his style of play is he's going to do that. Now, I do hope this coming season, even when he is back to 100%, he decides to slide a little bit more because we do need can't we do need Cam out there badly. But no, I just I don't think he's going to come back and be 100% just in general. And I think he can get to high 80s, maybe even low 90s in terms of percentages and what that looks like and everything is always hard to say. But I, I just don't think you're going to see him throwing his body around like he has in the past in general because I just don't think it's smart. And once again, it's his first time taking contact it just it doesn't seem like even though you can get back to being yourself 100 percent yourself just based on the timeline of the injury doesn't really seem like it's going to be the case come the 31st overall so i do think that cam will play as we discussed but yeah he just he's not going to be 100 percent. and just look in general quarterbacks coming off this, the injury the major injury he had they don't look the same their first game after i don't expect cam to have one of his five best games he's ever played as a youth coming back right away or to be look like him best self i think he can be very good and i think utah can still win with him being a very good quarterback but to say he's going to have over 70 yards rushing to me in his first game back i just I don't see how it happens. Yeah, no, that that's kind of my my point is like, yeah, I, I get it. He's going to be good, and he's a skilled passer regardless. Yes. But him coming back that first game back from the torn ACL, and it's also on top of that an even shorter recovery time than most quarterbacks have. I just I can't buy into. He's he's good to go. Don't worry about it. But just from your side of mm-hmm. things, because I understand, I I am a. Florida Gators fan, obviously, really? have been my entire. You may not know this, and my listeners may not know this by how uh, how honest I am about some things. But lifelong Florida Gators fan, I know how I feel about our side of things. But from the outside looking in, what is it that Utah? You, I mean, obviously, you specifically, but Utah fans also in general are thinking about the f- current Florida Gators quarterback situation. Yeah, Graham Mertz is a guy that I just have a lot of concerns about. Or I mean, if you, Utah wise, he's probably a thing where I'm like, I like Utah's secondary, the matchup they have against Graham Mertz because of how much he's turned the ball over overall in his career. And I'm someone too. I've actually just from my dad used to work in Wisconsin. I used to live in Wisconsin. So like I am a little bit of a Badgers fan. Like I would watch some games and I did see Graham Mertz really struggle in those games. We're talking about a guy in Graham Mertz in general who comes coming off two straight seasons in which he's thrown over 10 interceptions overall. So I personally have a lot of concerns about how Graham Mertz is going to do in his first game on the road in a tough environment to play in the altitude, his first game in a completely new offense with new players and everything. Um, I just, like I said, for me, I like that matchup for Utah. Graham Mertz is probably the biggest reason where last year, Anthony Richardson put up a Heisman type performance. I just, I, I don't see Graham Mertz having anything close to that in this game, Brandon. Yeah. Um, I, I, th- I think that's fair. I will say my biggest thing is I acknowledge what Graham Mertz is. I acknowledge he's not going to rush for three touchdowns against Utah like Anthony Richardson did. But my side of things is I think regardless of the current evaluation of Graham Mertz at Wisconsin, which I know everybody watches the Wisconsin tape and they're like, oh, yikes. But my thing is that offense with Wisconsin was just so bad. And I don't mean, oh, bad offensive line, but I I mean the scheme just straight up sucked i've said it before i think everybody involved in developing that wisconsin scheme you belong in prison for what you did to your players because it was awful it was 1905 before the forward pass was legal which is why i think graham Mertz, i think he's going to be significantly better than he was at wisconsin i'm still personally not sold that he's going to be better than average Mm-hmm. And at that, I just need you to not screw up and turn the ball over. So I, as long as you don't turn the ball over, you're good in my book, Graham. But I, th- I think from the Florida side of things, that's my perspective. I'm not sitting out here going, yep, highs Mertz. I'm not doing that. But I will say, if you can show up and just take care of the football, complete some first downs that I think last year we saw Anthony Richardson miss a lot of easy throws, which we will talk about also in a minute. But I feel like we saw him miss a lot of those easy throws and make these big explosive plays where I think now the trade-off is you don't have, you know, the 80 yard rushing touchdown that Anthony Richardson had against LSU. You don't have the 60 ish against Utah. I don't remember the exact yards, but I remember the play. I try, I try not to remember it either, Brandon. Yeah, I, I remember the play very vividly. You lose those, but you also, you're, you're going to complete slants now. And that's, that's obviously mm-hmm. a big thing for the Florida Gators here. So I think that's my, that's where I kind of land on Graham Merch. I'm like, you're not going to be awesome. I don't expect him to make a Joe Burrow rise, mm-hmm. 
but um, rise, no pun intended. Um, but I, I would like to say that I think that he's going to be better than we've seen before. It's just a matter of, you know, how, how great can he really be at this point? Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point when you mentioned, look, just, I mean, I'm just trying to think in general, like I don't know many Wisconsin quarterbacks that have really <laughs> dominated or had a lot of success because obviously they are a run heavy team, but you can be a run heavy team and still have be like a Cam Rising. Like they haven't had that, for example, at Wisconsin. So I, I definitely see your point. And as we're going to talk about, there is potential with some of the talent surrounding him for him to have a really good season here with what is around him overall. I think my thing overall is I'm just curious to how that's going to transfer in the very first game. This is where it's a plus for Utah when you're playing a Florida team with all these transfers and everyone that's coming in and it's the first game versus a lot of time, these new teams that come together, they get stronger as the season goes on. Yeah. I, I and I will also say just before we move to receivers where you, I'm not sure if you're going to make it through the segment. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if the listeners are going to make it through the segment either might slam the laptop shut. I will say with Wisconsin, my biggest thing was they ran play action on like, it was like 30% of their passing plays. And if you're going to run the ball 60% of the time, just disgusting that that's all you're going to run. Like Utah, one of the things they do, and I remember talking about this last year was Utah, they, they go under center, the 13 personnel, and then they run play action and it works. And Wisconsin was like, well, no, we want to be terrible. So I, I think for Graham Mertz, that's going to be a big benefit is the actual introduction of the play action pass for him. And he's going to be throwing two receivers, which we will talk about in just a second. Before we do that, though, if you're watching or listening and you haven't worn bird dogs yet, what on earth are you even doing? Because bird dogs are easily the most comfortable shorts that I've ever worn. I'm wearing them right now, and I'm, I'm not going to crotch shot the camera, but just believe me, I am. They're also the most versatile shorts I've ever worn. Their stretch khaki shorts are designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and legs. Give you a truly sculpted look, which, by the way, skies out, thighs out, baby. I'm, I'm just saying. That's my approach to things. Go to birddogs.com slash college or enter promo code LockedOnCollege for a free white tech hat with your order that's birddogs.com slash locked on college or use promo code locked on college for a free white tech hat and you won't want to take your bird dogs off like i won't we promise you thanks again for making locked on gators or locked on utes or both your first listen of the day we are available daily and free wherever you listen to podcasts i am brandon olson with locked on gators jt wister still is here from locked on utes and now i have to put you on the spot because Florida Twitter mm -hmm. has you in their crosshairs right now, which is also funny that the clip that that puts you in their crosshairs at least a week or two old. I remember watching. Than, I think it's more than that, honestly. <laughs> I remember watching it when it came yeah. out. And I, I was like, I disagree, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm not like I'm not dead to me. Like they, they were just <laughs> ready to kill you. And I, I need to know what it is about Florida's receivers that don't scare you because from my side of things, I look at Ricky Pearsall and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, last year is his first year with the team. I see a fluid route runner mm -hmm. with 20 yards per catch. I'd be pretty concerned. And I will also say, I, I mentioned this earlier before where you saw Anthony Richardson miss a lot of simple throws. Ricky was often the intended target on those missed throws. And Anthony Richardson even said it himself in, in press conferences. He was like, yeah, sometimes I just forget how fast Ricky is. And, that, and that's why my throws are behind him. And it's as simple as that. And so I look at 20 yards per catch from Ricky Pearsall, fluid route runner. And I'm like, okay, I'd be at least pretty concerned if, if I had to go against that, at least with him. And no disrespect to, to uh, Devon Bailey, but when I look at someone with 12 yards per catch, like Bailey has, just three yards per catch after the catch, I'm not super frightened by, by him. So the way that I see it is, each team has one scary pass catcher in Ricky Pearsall for Florida and Brant Keithy for Utah, but behind them on both sides, and sorry, Florida Gators fans, I, I see question marks throughout. Yeah, I, I feel the exact same way. That's where when I caught flack for this at the time, I was like, wait, what did I do? Did I make a mistake? And I start looking back through all the Florida, just the depth of the receiver position. And I'm like, wait, no, I didn't. And look, I think you make a really compelling argument for Purcell. And I'll say that the potential of what he could be does make me worry. I still don't know if I would say scared, though, because we haven't seen it play out in terms of with Graham Mertz. Can Graham Mertz hit him the first game for that 20-yard pass? Maybe. 
that's what we'll wait and see. But I just still look, we are talking about a guy who had over 600 yards receiving last year, but once that's what Devon Bailey had, he had over 700 yards as well. And I don't put Bailey in the scary class either yet. I know what you mentioned that explosive playability is key though. So I can hear the argument for Persaw. I don't fear him personally, but I can see the potential where he does have a big day at Utah, at least, especially more than these other guys. But once again, I was talking about the receiving core. Persaw is the best guy. Persaw is really nice. I think he's a really good receiver. Let's look at the rest of these guys. I, I think everyone else you're projecting out to what they could be because when you look at the production of what they've done in the past, it's, I know a lot of people like will be like, Caleb Douglas is nice. I mean, he had 10 catches for 175 yards last year. Could be good, but we haven't seen it once again. Then you get these other guys, uh, Marcus Burke, a four-star recruit, but he, going back to him, eight games, four receptions for 30 yards. That, that doesn't scare me once again. I reserve scary for a cert, the Brant Keithys of the world, just like guys who I think of along the lines of the best or near the top of their position overall guys who just can reach that level even like a eugene wilson someone tagged me in him he is playing his first ever game in utah so in a new climate on the road all those things could he be very good and have a very good season yeah but i just don't think there's a lot of history to show these freshman receivers walking on the scene and just dominating in a brand new environment like that overall so it's just a lot of unproven guys overall to me um this is a receiving room in general i mean there was no receiver on this florida team last year that is coming back that is it was in the top 125 in receiving yards overall the, the second like Persall was obviously in the top 460 but no one else coming back was in terms of receiving yards last year there is potential for this group to do some really nice things but potential this the kind of potential that these guys have it doesn't scare me yet because i haven't seen it i've seen a lot of four and five star recruits that have bust i wish every it worked out for every player that they were all boom guys but it just doesn't always work out that way so that's where this pass catching group for the florida gators it doesn't scare me right now brandon yeah I, and here's the thing that i know Florida Gators fans and, and my listeners are probably going to try to behead you for again. I think it's not wrong to say that they're not scary. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that that's wrong again, because they are unproven. Marcus Burke is, you know, he, he's tall, he's fast. He he's made some nice plays, but again, like you mentioned, you have four catches for 30 yards. Shouldn't be very scary, but again, mm -hmm. now you're seeing someone step into a bigger role and he's going to be used more as a deep threat. Caleb Douglas is likely going to be the starting X this year. Uh, Aiden Mizell, in, incredibly fast, true freshman, sure. But he runs, I, I think it's uh, uh, a 10, 800 meter. He's very fast. And that's the thing that I think Florida fans are, are getting accustomed to now is that all of the true freshmen are way faster than anybody we've had in Florida for quite some time. Because I don't know if, if uh, Gators fans or Ute fans know this, we're all familiar with Dan Mullen. He did a thing called a demolish the Florida Gators roster as far as recruiting goes. And I think that's where a lot of Florida Gators fans, we see all, all these dynamic playmakers being added to the team and what they can be and what, what they did in high school. And it's just, they're going to be immediately fantastic options. And I don't, I'm not going to sit here and say that they are going to be or that they're not going to be my stance has been and will continue to be, we don't know what they're going to be. So they can be scary. Could be. They cannot be scary. <laughs> but it, it's about that projection where, like, again, I, I'm a big film guy. I see Caleb Douglas. I get it. Ten catches, 175 mm -hmm. yards, two touchdowns. One of those uh, came against Eastern Washington, if I'm not mistaken. I wouldn't be terrified of that, just looking at the stats. But if I'm looking at the film and I see Caleb Douglas and I see a, an athlete, with his size and his jump ball ability, I think that's where I go with projecting players like Caleb Douglas where he's not scary right now. But I do think that Utah fans are going to find out what he can bring to the table early in the year also because I, I think that's where it's kind of we think we know what he's going to be or we think we know what these players are going to be and we just assume that they're already there. And I think that's kind of where where the disconnect goes between, and that happens with every single fan base, by the way. Like, like let's not pretend that there's not Utah fans going, "This freshman's gonna kill it, it a thousand yards this year." It ain't gonna happen. But I, I think that that's where things get a little bit lost. We'll say.
I, I absolutely agree. Because like you said, I mean, the guy is on paper, the potential, the speed, the athleticism being max- maximized with a more, uh, which should be a more accurate passer. It sounds like outside of maybe those big, crazy, explosive plays in a Graham Mertz, if he can hit his potential. That's the part where I'm like, okay, that could be really dangerous. But like you said, you could just we could play out the hypotheticals for every team. And it's like why I could see them being really good. But just in college sports in general, I mean, I, I already mentioned some of the five stars and four stars who it just hasn't worked out for them for whatever reason. So that's why for me, I reserve kind of like that scary tag for someone who's done it. And for example, Brant Keithy looked like he was going to have an unreal season last year after his game against Florida had over hundred yards in that game. Looked, he was just torching everyone out there. It looked like he was really special, that type of player. That's where if I was, there was someone on Florida coming back who had that type of receiving production. And I think you make a really good point too. in just mentioning how the issues with Anthony Richardson might've not allowed some of those guys, like even a personal who may be with a more accurate quarterback is easily a thousand yard guy. Maybe that is where that fear aspect would come into it more for me overall, but that's where for me, like I mentioned, I just, I'm not to the fear aspect yet, but I definitely see the potential where it's like one of these guys, just when you pitch me the athleticism on paper and what they do, I'm like, okay, I could see how he could go for a hundred yards against Utah. I do think Utah has good defensive backs over on their backfield. I look at a guy like Zamaya Vaughn who had nine pass deflections last year, who I do think is ready to step into a little bit of a bigger role as well. I, I think a guy in JT Broughton, these are guys who return to a Utah defense that was still one of the best in the Pac-12. Did they have their struggles? Absolutely. But I will say this as well. So much of obviously pass defense is tied to your pass rush. Utah's pass rush was abysmal last year. How many times do Gator fans remember watching Utah players get in the backfield and then Anthony Richardson shaking them out the play? Now, Anthony Richardson's a great quarterback, but there were a lot of college quarterbacks who, who did that last year overall, just in general. I should say uh, great is just escaping pressure in general because he is so hard to bring down because of that size and physicality. Utah's pass rush struggled all year last year. And so many of those passing plays I felt like would come after five seconds. I, I assume most people listening to this have never tried to cover someone at the collegiate level for five seconds. It's extremely challenging to do so. So that's where also I feel like the pass rush should be a little improved this year. And you will get to see how good those Utah defensive backs are. But Clark Phillips is gone. So that is a guy to replace. they got a couple guys coming in like a miles battle from Ole Miss who could be good, but it's one of those interesting things. I mean, you have roster turnover coming up next in general, Brandon, that we're going to be touching on here in a moment. So it kind of segues really well where uh, it's just going to be interesting to see how it plays out uh, this matchup between the Florida corners who have the potential to be really special players and Utah defensive backs, who I also think have a chance to be really special this year. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to that matchup. I will say, I think Ricky's going over a hundred. Um, I'll, I'll throw that in the one game. Up. Okay. Yeah. I, I think he's going over a hundred in, in that game. Um, not 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 disrespectful to to anybody on Utah, okay. but I, I I think Ricky's mm-hmm. damn good. I think he's gonna, or I know he's going to have a passer <laughs> that's going to complete more than fifty three percent of his passes this year. So I, I I think it's safe to say, like, yeah, he's gonna do that. Ricky does have, I believe, Ricky has over a hundred yards in his career against Utah, just because he had about seventy last year, uh, and then two years ago when he was with Arizona State, he had about thirty five or forty. So mm-hmm. he did in his career. Now he's just gonna double that in, in one game. Before we do talk about just the roster turnover, like replacing Clark Phillips, who also unfortunately uh, got hurt today. All that. Yeah, he got, he got hurt today in practice, which is very unfortunate. I am going to talk to you about FanDuel because football season is about to kick off for both college and the NFL. And FanDuel is giving you a chance to win all season long. I don't know why they're doing this, by the way. This, this just seems like a bad idea, but hey. Go ahead, do it. It's your money, FanDuel, not mine. And right now, when you bet on a Super Bowl winner, not the Jets, Yikes. <laughs> you can get bonus bets every time they win in the regular season. So pick anybody to win the Super Bowl. Chiefs, duh, obviously the favorite right now. They're plus 600. Uh, the Eagles, I believe, are plus 850 right now probably going to have a lot of wins in the regular season. Guess what? Every time that they win in the regular season, you get bonus bets. So bet on anybody to win the Super Bowl and get bonus bets back. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and start earning bonus bets with America's number one sportsbook. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Now, JT, we're wrapping up today talking about roster turnover because last season huge talking point before Florida versus Utah this season, huge talking point between Florida versus Utah. Also, I will say every season, this is going to be a talking point, whether you get to be on Utah's side of things and go great roster turnover, not a ton of attrition. We have a lot of starters returning and Florida side where you go, okay, we, we are replacing 
a lot of players here. That's going to be a thing every year, week one. Get used to it. That's especially life with the transfer portal. So if you're a college football fan, get used to that. But I think one of Utah's biggest, I, I guess we'll say strengths, is their consistency with returning starters. Like, like that's something where I feel like every year we go, oh, Utah gets to do this thing of having returning starters or even just returning second string players elevating up to starters. That's something that they get to pat themselves on the back for, which I, I can't wait to get to do that with the Florida Gators. But just what kind of just state is Utah's roster in right now? I mean, Utah's in a really lucky, lucky spot. Let's just say this. Like, you lost Dalton Kincaid. That's a huge loss. Wasn't even the best tight end on the field against Florida last year. That's like, it's just such a, it's one of the best transitions I can recall in college sports in so long. Like, you're going from a player of Dalton to Brant Keithy. Like, that's just such a seamless transition. And even if you want to go back up tight end, Thomas Yasmin needs to put it all together. If you just look at some of his big plays, like, he's the guy who he could catch a, a just a pass. And like, if a guy, if a defender misses a tackle, I mean, he could go for 50 yards. Like, he has that kind of special speed and an athlete overall. So the tight end depth is still there. Uh, the biggest concern wise for me on roster turnover is left tackle. And uh, Brandon, I can't remember the name of your defensive end last year who faced off against Braden Daniels, but I thought he did a very good job. I actually thought he might've won that matchup overall. I can't remember if he ever got home for a sack or not, but uh, did a very good job there. So left tackle, that's the one where you're going to have turnover. It's just going to be a backup guy coming in, but I don't, the projected guy right now, this stuff is always fluid to change. Hasn't started a game for Utah. So that obviously very concerns me there. Um, but you get pretty much your top pass catchers back at the re- at the receiver position as well. Uh, running back wise, yes, Tavion Thomas is not there for you Florida Gator fans who remember, but he was by no he was nowhere even close to the best running back in this room by the end of the season. He had really fallen off. And there's a guy in Jaquindon Jackson who's pretty special, and I think is going to have a monster year. His first full season playing running back after transitioning from a quarterback to a running back the year before. Uh, defensively, Utah's front seven struggled a lot last season in general, and Florida has a really good rushing attack. I mean, you look at the two running backs you guys got, that's something that bears worrying about offensive line wise, decent on paper. I'm curious how everything comes together just in game one. I think that's my kind of question mark there, but really like Utah's interior defensive tackles, defensive end wise. I feel like you got guys coming back that are going to be more hungry to get home and will be better. Bring in another transfer linebacker and Leovani Damuni, who I expect to be better starting off than a Mahmoud Diabate did just because of his from he's more comfortable playing inside backer as Diabate was still trying to acclimate that. I still feel like he was best as an outside linebacker overall. And the biggest loss is Clark Phillips. You will not replace Clark Phillips. I will say I still feel like you can have a I think Vaughn and Broughton, who were both very good last year, can be a little bit better. And I think with a guy like a Miles Battle, a veteran coming over, I think he can be a good second to third kind of best cornerback in that room overall. So I, I like this Utah football roster. I think the guys they've replaced are good. Um, you and I were talking a little earlier off air, like overall, like all these guys don't pan out as you project them. But I think Utah's they're just lucky to have so many returners back. So there's very little projecting to do in certain spots. Yeah, I I think that's the huge advantage because I I say this on my show very frequently where I get it, replacing all these players for Florida. Like last year before Florida versus Utah, Utah fans kept going in my comments and they were like, ah, replacing all these players, replacing all these players. And they didn't want to listen when I said, hey, we're replacing them with better football players, Mm -hmm. which every every fan is going to say. So I get why you wouldn't (laughs) listen to someone. But that was actually the case last year. This year... I feel like there are certain spots where Florida replaced with better players, certain spots where they necessarily didn't like last you're replacing Osiris Torrance last year, according to PFF was the best guard in the country. You can't replace him with a better player, but what Florida did do, they went out and got Micah Mazuka from Baylor and he was according to PFF, the second best guard in the country. So, So you have the best returning guard in the country, according to that. But again, you mentioned Florida's offensive line. You know, you're going through quite a few changes. You're replacing uh, four of five starters because you have Kingsley Iguakin is back at center. Outside of that, no returning starters. Austin Barber was a, a, a semi-starter last year for Florida, but he's your new starting left tackle. If Micah Mazuka, who's been dealing with an injury, is fully healthy, then great. He's your starting left guard. But right guard, right tackle, up for grabs. One of the guys competing for the spots is in concussion protocol right now. So we'll see what's going on with that. I think that's one of the things, though, where you're replacing Anthony Richardson with Graham Mertz. And I I don't even care who you replace Anthony Richardson with because you're not replacing him with someone that's more dynamic. No matter who you took from the portal, you're not taking someone more dynamic. So I think from Florida side of things, I think that, yeah, it's great to have all these players where you go, oh, like they can be better than what we had last year. And I've mentioned Graham Mertz, 
I don't think he's better than Anthony Richardson. However, I do think he can, he gives us a higher floor, although a lower ceiling at the same time. I, I just, I'm hard pressed to go, oh, all of these guys who are now stepping into either starting roles or stepping onto the roster for the first time, I have a very difficult time going, they're all going to work out. Don't worry about it. And then for me, that's my biggest issue with trying to project what the hell Flora is going to do this year is that I know not all of those players are going to work out. Yeah, it's the same issue Utah is going to have next year with Cam Rising and all these other returners are gone. It's always a very difficult thing to look at. I mean, just in general, and we'll talk, we have, we'll have our preview show coming up the week of the game. So we'll dive into this more, but there are so many matchups that just intrigue me in this game. Like Florida's rushing offense versus Utah's front seven. Like I like a Leobani Dumuni. Is he going to hit the ground running right away? How will he do? How will that offensive line do in their first game in the altitude in a really loud environment where communication is key? And Utah had a lot of success last year dialing up exotic blitzes. Exotic blitzes, the best way to stop those is excellent communication along the offensive line. This will be the first time that Florida Gators unit is that group of five will be tested together in that environment. How's that going to go? There are so many great matchups and just so many unknowns, which is it leads even back to the fear of the receivers thing. Are those guys going to take off right away and going to have per, like personal? Is he going to go over 100 yards right away? Or is going to be multipliers over 100 yards? Is he, yeah, he's already shaking his head. Yes, exactly. Um, Graham Mertz, is he going to hit the ground running or is he going to struggle in his first game and throw two interceptions? I, I think that's possible that he could have multiple turnovers in the first game. Also possible that he doesn't and you guys are able to establish a ground game and he's not. So th- this is going to be an incredibly great game. I think I, I've said before, look, I do. I think if Cam Rising plays that Utah will win by 10 points. I do. But I also think this is a game where Utah, like this is a good game going into halftime. And this is also a 10-point game where it's like, man, that felt more like a three-point game or in that kind of the line because I think both these rosters are really good. And even the pieces that Florida is replacing, if they click, depending on how early they click, it could be a really good roster. Yeah, uh, I think that with this game, I've I've said it, by the way, I I know that FanDuel right now has a line for this game at nine and a half points Mm -hmm. favoring Utah. Um, and because of that, I hope everybody does bet on a Super Bowl winner and takes all of FanDuel's money because they do not deserve it if they're going to set that line. So I think that's wild. I think that no matter who wins this game, it's going to be close. I, I think it's going to be a one-score game. That's what I th- And I said that last year. I will say that this year. I think that this is going to be close. There, there, we'll talk more scheme-specific things when we get closer to it. Again, we are going to do this again before the actual game, the week of the game. We're going to do it. But for today, thanks for making Locked On Gators or Locked On Utes your first listen of the day. Every day, check out Locked On SEC with Chris Gordy. Check out Locked On Pac-12 with Spencer McLaughlin. For Locked On Gators, I'm Brandon Olson. For Locked On Utes, it's JT Wistersill. Thank you so much. And I apologize for not ripping JT's head off like many Florida Gators fans wanted me to do. But I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm a little more a little more right here right now. But, but the week of the game, don't worry. I'm... I'm just, it's over. Just know that. But thank you so much.